Okay, so today there's really three things that I was um, aiming to get across. So first, I want to talk a little bit about why I think we should be language agnostic. Um, second, kind of why Python is a language that, that we should be considering. Um, and then third, just to show some examples of building decision models, snippets of code side by side using Python um, and using R to hopefully make it more clear how we can use Python. All right, so with that in mind, first, why not just use R? Um, as I kind of just hinted at, in my opinion at least, the concept of R, R for HTA should really be about encouraging good coding practices and using fit for purpose tools, um, not for using one particular tool and in particular not for switching from one existing dominant tool like Excel to another one like R. Um, one reason for this is that all languages have their own strengths and weaknesses. So to me, it makes sense to treat them as complements um, rather than substitutes for each other. So here is just a list of certainly not exhaustive. Um, some interpreted languages, I think there was an R for HTA talk a couple of years ago about using Julia. We all know about R. Um, whenever we use any of these languages sort of under the hood, we're gonna be using a bunch of compiled code, C, C++, Fortran. Um, and then anyone that does any kind of work with estimation, um, in a Bayesian framework, we'll use even kind of specialized languages like Stan, Jags, Bugs, um, and we can really use them all together. In some instances, we can actually use an interpreted languages like R or Python to generate code in another language, for example, like, like Stan code. So why Python in particular? Um, I think the, the first reason is, is really that it's just uh, a very, has a very, very large and highly collaborative developer and user community. So there's a table on the right here, um, which is basically comparing the popularity based on Google searches uh, of different languages. You can see Python is kind of by far the most popular language. And I think you know there's different ways to look at it, but however you slice it, kind of Python is gonna be right at the top. And what does this mean? Um, it means the language itself is always improving. Um, it's always going to have state-of-the-art tooling. It's kind of the language of choice in the tech community. Um, so it's what computer scientists like to use. Um, that means it's also a general purpose. So it can solve our scientific problems, but it's also great when you want to create things like web applications um, or put code into production. And sort of along these lines, it's by far the dominant language in machine learning. Um, so all kind of the, the dominant packages, TensorFlow, PyTorch, Scikit-Learn, um, any of the large language model type stuff, that, that's all gonna be done within Python. Um, and the precursor for a lot of that is just a, a kind of a suite of excellent, in my opinion, scientific libraries. So we have packages like Pandas for working with kind of like it's sort of like dplyr working with um, data sets. NumPy is a, a package for working with n-dimensional arrays. SciPy is a scientific computing library. Um, and X-Ray, I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. It is also a cool way to, to basically be able to label our arrays. And what I've found is that these packages actually even compared to R have really reduced the amount of time that I need to use compiled code, um, which is, I think, hugely advantageous because it makes the code a lot more readable, maintainable, um, and also more flexible for, for users. Um, additionally, in, in Python, classes are, are first class citizens. So what do I mean by that? Um, in R, we have concepts of classes, but to me, they're sort of an afterthought of the initial language. So we have things like S4, people didn't really like that. They switched to R6, um, but still the dominant paradigm is more of a, a functional approach. And I think when you're when I've had experience writing kind of larger software programs, even just simple decision models, being able to work with classes um, makes the code a lot more organized um, and the API a lot uh, more consistent. Um, another thing that's different about R, I think R kind of, at least originally before the tidyverse came along, sort of didn't really have a, a consistent sense of style. Whereas Python has something called PEP8, which is actually an official style guide, which most people would adhere to. 
And in my experience, it, it makes learning the language easier. It's a very simple syntax. Um, and it also just makes the code a lot cleaner and I think easy to collaborate with. Um, and finally, while both R and Python are dynamic languages, Python also has something called type checking, um, which some people like, some people don't. Um, but basically what it means is we can, when we write our code, um, we can check whether the inputs and the outputs are the expected types. So like if you're expecting, say, an array as an input, we can actually check that before we run the code, um, which is a good way to, to figure out if we have any, any bugs or unintended problems in our code. All right, so with that bit of background, how do we actually use the, the two languages? Um, so very basic, starting off, how do we simply just import a package? So we all know in R, we use a library call to, to import packages. Uh, in Python, it's very similar. We have what's called an import statement. Um, only main difference is we can actually import like within a specific namespace. So for example, if we want to import code uh, from the NumPy package, we can actually say import NumPy as NP. That way, when we look at our code, we can always call the NP numspace, which makes it um, namespace, which makes it a little easier to follow. So we'll see this in action in just a bit. All right, so now to go to maybe some concrete examples so you can kind of see the languages side by side. So here is uh, just a very simple example of a little function that creates a transition three by three transition probability matrix. So always we're gonna have the R code on the right, the Python code on the left. Um, so with R, just from the base package, we know there's the matrix function. Um, so we can uh, initialize a matrix basically with a vector. So here we have a vector length nine. We're going to fill the matrix by row. So first row transition probabilities will be 0 0.8, 0 0.1, 0 0.1. Second row, 0, 0.5, 0 0.5. Third row, 0, 0, 1. You can see on the left with Python, it's actually very, very similar. Um, one notable difference is unlike R, there's no like base matrix function. So we're gonna actually use NumPy, which is the scientific library for working with arrays um, using the NP namespace. And what we're gonna do instead of creating a matrix in NumPy, there's not really a concept of a matrix. It's basically N dimensional arrays. So here we're creating a two dimensional array, which is the same as, as a matrix on the left. Additionally, you'll see the, we can document functions in classes in a similar way in both languages. So you can see on the right, we're using Roxygen to essentially create a documentation, say what is returned by the function. On the left, we're using something called um, doc strings, which is what we have in, in Python. Um, I think two notable differences, um, or maybe minor differences in R, if you want to kind of create our documentation so it's more human readable, we typically work with an R package. Um, and when we have an R package, we can kind of create the, the documentation. With Python, that's not really necessary. There's not so much of a difference between a package and kind of just a regular code. So when you write the doc string, um, you sort of also get the documentation for free. And as I mentioned, there's more of a concept of types in Python. So you can see like when we're writing the function, we're going to say explicitly what's returned. It's returning a NumPy n-dimensional array. Um, where in R, it's kind of just more in the language that we have. OK, so getting just a little bit more complicated, um, let's think about simulating uh, a simple Markov model. So this is just going to be deterministic, say, one treatment strategy. Um, and you'll see the code to do it in R on the right, the code to do it in Python on the left are actually really similar. So they're almost identical, save a little syntax differences. So for instance, if we look at the first row in both languages, what are we doing? We're creating an empty matrix to store output for our, Mark our Markov trace. Um, in the second row, we're going to say in sort of time zero, everyone's going to start in the same health state. So we're going to have a vector one, zero, zero. So basically, if we think of our model as like a sick, sick or death, everyone's going to be in the sick state um, at the beginning. Then we're just going to loop 
through the number of cycles. You can see the syntax is, is very similar. Only difference um, are some minor things with the syntax. Like you can see the matrix multiplication and R slightly different. Um, we have an at symbol in Python. We've um, slightly different in R. And Python indexing starts at zero, whereas R indexing starts at one. Um, so those are really the, the only notable, notable differences. And when we run the output, um, we'll have R again on the right, Python on the left. So we should all, we're all familiar with R. Um, if we have like a functions in an external file, we can read them in using source. Um, we can run our code, look at our output. So you see the transition probabilities that we created, and then we see the state probabilities by model cycle. So it's just a matrix. Rows are the model cycles. Columns are the health states. So again, period zero or time zero, everyone in the sixth state, and then we're going to simulate that Markov trace over time. Um, on the left with Python, we're doing the same thing. Um, as I mentioned in Python, there's like a little bit more of a concept of a namespace. So instead of just kind of sourcing in our functions, we can actually put them in a namespace. So we'll say we're going to import our functions as HTA. Um, and then when we call any of our functions, they're going to be within that HTA namespace, which can make the code a, a little bit cleaner to, to look at, or at least more clear where the functions are coming from. Okay, so then another example, um, taking a look at computing some, some qualities. Um, on the right, we, we have the R code. And here again, you can see that the concept of Python and R are very similar. Um, the matrix multiplication is almost identical on the right with the R that we have with Python on the left. Um, if we want to say compute um, the number of rows in a matrix, we in R we say n rows. In Python, very similar, we have a, a shape. Basically, every array will have a shape. So the first element of that shape is going to be the number of rows, which is the, the n years. Um, again, as I mentioned, in R, we're going to always have indexing that starts um, at 1. Python, it starts at, at 0. Um, and if, say, we want to create an array of times, which is the third line, in R, we have the sequence function. Um, Python, we have in the NumPy space in our, uh, what's called an A range function. So again, even though the language may be slightly different, the way we go about it is, is very, very similar. So you can see these codes. I mean, I think if you look on the right and the one on the left, it's pretty easy to see that it's really doing the, the same thing. Um, again, we look at the output. Um, so if you looked at how kind of the, we create the output, just call the function, you see we get the same results um, using both approaches, just computing some qualities with a, a very simple discount rate. Okay, so those are some kind of very simple examples showing side by side how we can use Python and R to compute uh, similar tasks. So one question you might have is, are there any advantages that Python has that R can't do? Um, and, and in my opinion, as I kind of hinted at earlier, there actually are some things that I found that, that actually can make Python advantageous. And one of the biggest, in my opinion, is kind of working with high dimensional arrays or matrices. So one thing I've often done building these kind of models in R is, I found it a little hard to generalize to like higher dimensions. I've often used RCPP to make code a little bit faster. Um, and what I found in Python is like none of that is really needed. Um, there's this concept of basically n dimensional matrix multiplication where you can have sort of as many dimensions in your array as you want and still do matrix multiplication. So that means if you want to kind of have PSA, probabilistic sensitivity analysis for parameter uncertainty. You want to have multiple treatment strategies, multiple cohorts. It basically doesn't change the code at all. And additionally, we have a concept of called labeled arrays in Python using something called the X-Array package, where we can actually put labels on all the dimensions and coordinates we have, which makes it really easy to see what's going on. And I'll show some examples of that in just a second. <clears throat> 
Um, so here's a function which is simulated a Markov model, but now we're going to do a PSA. And what you'll notice is the code is actually almost identical to the code we had when we did the deterministic case before. So we didn't have to add any extra loop or kind of have any anything else that we had to, to, to take care of. So you'll see um, first row, we're just going to say first axis is going to be the number of simulations. So basically now instead of a two, instead of producing a two-dimensional array, we're going to want to output a three-dimensional array where the first axis is the number of simulations. Um, the second axis is the number of model cycles, and the third axis is the number of health states. Um, so we're going to initialize that three-dimensional array. Um, again, we're going to say everyone starts in the same health state. So we just see that the second axis um, for that first cycle, or time zero cycle, we have a vector one, zero, zero. We do our loop over model cycles. And what you can see is, all we've done is added a new axis, which is the first axis, and that's going to be the simulation axis. And we just do our same matrix multiplication. And essentially what that means is we're going to do our matrix multiplication for every additional axis that we have. Um, so say we want to add another dimension, like a treatment strategies dimension or a dimension for subgroups. All we do is prepend a few other axes, and the code would be identical to what we have here. Um, and what that means is we can really vectorize our code, but in a super um, readable way. And you'll see the output that we have on the right. Um, we're now producing our state probabilities, or our Markov trace. But you see now, instead of being two-dimensional, it's three-dimensional. So each slice, for example, on the right-hand side is a simulation of the parameters from the, the PSA. And in my opinion, working kind of with these higher dimensions is hard to read. So like, it's hard to remember, well, what's the first axis? What's the second axis? And so on. Um, and that's where this concept of a labeled array comes into play, in particular with the X-ray package. So we have that three-dimensional array, say our state probabilities, and now we're just going to label the dimensions. Um, so we're going to say the first dimension is the simulation dimension. The second dimension is a time dimension. The third dimension is a state dimension. And we'll add coordinates. So simulations just ordered from 0 to number of simulations minus 1. Time, we'll say it's in years. So it's kind of time 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And then the states, sick, sicker, death. And now you can see the output that we have on the right. Now it's a labeled array. So we can see explicitly. Um, simulate the different dimensions, the coordinates, and it makes it a lot easier to understand uh, what's going on in our array. Um, and actually, not only that, I think I forgot if you look down here at the bottom, um, we can actually do arithmetic operations now explicitly calling out the dimensions we want to do them over. So if you want to take an average or a mean over the simulation dimension, it's as simple as calling mean dim equals sim. So now you see we produce a 2D matrix where we've got the state average state probabilities across the, the simulation dimensions. So again, it's kind of seamless working with this high dimensional arrays. Um, and just to, to close things out, um, kind of going back to what I talked about earlier, I think the, the main thing, in my opinion, that should be stressed is just kind of enforcing good practices with, with both languages or with any language we want. Um, and this actually is similar to what we just saw in Gregory's talk, um, but kind of regardless of the language that, that we're going to work with, in my opinion, there's kind of a, a series of, of pr good practices that should be followed. So for instance, if you're creating a decision model, in my opinion, it's a good idea to create documentation, both for yourself, for others, um, we can do it in both Python and R. You should use a process to, to manage software dependencies. So we have RENV and R. There's equivalence in Python. Um, we can actually automate the enforcing of good coding style called linters. So R, there's something called lintr. Python, there's something called pylints. Um, so that will like automatically check if your code is an adherent to the style you want. So that way you don't have to kind of like look at people's code. It just does it automatically. 
Um, likewise, uh, a styler will automatically modify it. So not just check if it's bad, it'll actually put it into the correct format. Um, there's something called pre-commit, which you can use, which will, before you make a commit, it'll basically like do all these checks so that way you'll never commit something that you don't want because the, the pre-commit will check your code. Um, we should always use unit tests to you know, make sure that our code is correct. And I think even if you're building a decision model, this is a good idea. Um, it's been for us a really good way to validate our models, help other people's uh, help other people review it, so they kind of know what to review. Um, and then finally, I think Gregory touched on this, but you can use continuous integration, basically automatically check all of the stuff before you put your um, like in GitHub. You might want to merge all your code into a main branch, and that's like your official branch, and you can kind of automate all these checks um, before you do that. So just sort of to to close. Um, these are just some screenshots of kind of what some of these checks might look like on the top. Um, here's Pylon telling me that one of my variables wasn't in the right naming style for Python. Um, on the, the bottom uh, left, here's GitHub doing some checks of my code before it's potentially merged into main. So it's kind of going through a code review, both with a person and some automatic checks. Um, on the right hand side, some unit tests, and here's a pre commit basically checking a lot of my code to, to make sure that it's in the, in the right style. Um, so that's it. Thank you. Thanks very much. And if we have time, um, see if there's any questions. Thanks, Devin. That's fascinating and it's quite brave in an R for HTA <laughs> <laughs> workshop, but yeah. A lot to think. Well, I appreciate you guys letting me. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Go a little bit different. Um, there are questions here, but we're also five minutes into the break. So, would you mind just addressing those in the chat, and I can let people take a break? Um, yeah, sure we, thing. Sorry we, for going a bit over. No, no, not at all. I think. It's